what I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I feel like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders, the founders of RX Bars. Um, if you don't know that story, they sold to Kellogg for $600 million. Check out that interview I did with Peter. Um, it was before they sold, and actually I knew even how big they were and how they built up that brand. P90X founder Tony Horton talks about how he made money as a street mine before he sold hundreds of millions of dollars. That's how he actually made money, Jason. He would uh, put a hat out on the street um, for his food and apartment money as a street mime. And um, Baby Einstein founder uh, grew to $20 million with five staff in three years, more impressed, and ended up selling to Disney. More impressive, they, she battled cancer twice and overcame that. And uh, Nolan Bushnell, founder of Atari, who was Steve Jobs' mentor, he talks about how Steve offered Nolan 33% of Apple for $50,000 and why he said no to that. Um, this episode is brought to you by Rise25, which I co-founded with my business partner, John Corcoran. Our mission at Rise25 is to find you your best referral partners and customers, and we do that through our Done For You podcast solution, which I believe is the best thing I've ever done for my life and business. I know Jason is nodding along with me, and he believes that as well and, and lives it, and we'll talk about his podcast. Uh, we help your company completely run and launch your podcast, distribute it across all channels, do everything so you could show up and you know really uh, talk to your best referral partners and clients. And our goal is for you to ROI from your podcast, not just create great content, which we want that to be too. Um, but it's allowed me to connect with founders of you know, Jason, P90X, Atari, Einstein Bagels, Mattel, and and on and on. So. Um, check out rise25.com. We do have a greater mission behind what we do, which is um, John and I realized our grandfathers were a huge inspiration. My grandfather was a Holocaust survivor who escaped Nazi Germany. At the same time, John's grandfather was a B-17 captain and pilot who flew 35 missions over Nazi Germany. And so we honor our grandfather's legacy. So we have a scholarship, a veteran entrepreneur scholarship for any of our VIP events that we run or any events that we run. Um, you can go to rise25.com slash mission. If you know a veteran entrepreneur or you are one, apply. It could be an all expenses. Pay, you know, uh, Jason, you know, you, you've been to um, TNC. We had a mastermind the day before. It, it was all expense paid for that. And then also we got them a ticket to the conference and hotel and flight. Um, so if you know of someone, send them to rise25.com slash mission. Um, and today we have Jason Swank, who, if you don't know him, he runs a unique consultancy helping marketing agency owners grow their agencies faster. So if you are an agency or you know an agency, you need to send them to jasonswank.com. He is the resource he wish he had when he started his agency. Um, he also has, you know, two podcasts, the Smart Agency Masterclass podcast, where they share strategies and stories from real agency owners and Swank Today, which is a weekly show that documents how you can grow your digital agency. Um, early on, Jason quit his day job, launched a digital marketing agency, grew it to a multi-million dollar operation. It's not as easy as I'm making it out. Uh, hundred Grew it to 100 staff. We were working with brands with AT&T, Hitachi, Lotus Cars, and after 12 years, sold the agency. Um, and Jason, thank you for joining me. Oh, thanks for having me on. I'm honored to be on the show, especially with the people you listed out. I was like, wow, you're really lowering the bar with me on it. <laughs> not at all. Not at all. You help the, those type of companies grow actually with the agency and you're affecting a lot of these companies because the agencies you help, you know, basically work with these companies. So, um, I, I just do have to do a, a pitch for your podcast because, um, people need to go to jasonswink.com. Um, I, have listened to every episode of your podcast. So um, that, that's not just something, you know, I, I just say lightly. Um, I, I was checking out today. I missed two episodes. So I listened to them on my way in of Swank Today. Um, there's 172 episodes. I've listened to every single one of those. And the Smart Agency, there's 202 episodes. I've listened to all of those. So I think anyone who runs a business, forget about, I mean, yes, agency, but the stuff you teach really gets in, any business can use what you teach. So I know you, what made you start a podcast in the first place? Obviously we both believe in the power of podcasting. Oh yeah. I mean, it was the number one thing I've ever done, but you know, when, when I sold my agency, I had a lot of competitors reaching out old competitors in the agency world being like, 
hey, how'd you get LegalZoom? How'd you get Lotus? How'd you sell? How'd you do all this? And I was like, well, yeah, I, I helped them out for free. And so I was like, well, let's record some of these episodes over Google Hangout. And then let me reach out to some other people I know that are, you know, as successful as we were or right around it. And let's interview them on Google Hangout and then put it on YouTube. And at the time, one of my friends, Gene, was like, hey, you should do a podcast. I'm like, all I knew about podcasting back in like 2014 or 14 was I would watch like Pat Flynn's podcast. I didn't know you could do it on your phone. <laughs> right. And I was like, who's going to watch? Like, it's so boring. And they're like, hey, dummy. <laughs> it literally can go in your pocket. I'm like, oh, OK. And then so I started taking that audio out putting it on, you know, iTunes and Google Play and all that. And it changed everything. Like I could reach people all over. And, and I just started people reaching out all over the world. I mean, like, hey, you know, I love that story. I'm like, really? You listen to it? Like, and it just been kept growing ever since. So I kind of got started by accident, really. Yeah. So if someone's like, I want the pot, what do you point? Do you point them more to Swank today or the Smart Agency Masterclass? So go to Swank it. Swank it. <laughs> Swank Swank dot it. And it okay. links to both shows. Got it. <laughs> cool. You know, I was talking to our friend, uh, mutual friend, Ian Garlic, who I love. Oh, no. um, so oh, no. shout out to him. I know you have, <laughs> you have choice words with each other. No, but um, <laughs> check out the Ian, you know, the Ian Garlic. He's got a uh, Ian Garlic marketing show. His podcast is awesome too. Um, and you've done a few episodes with him, but I was asking him since he knows you so intimately, what questions we should talk about. And <laughs> And um, he had some snide remarks, but, but on a serious note, he, we were talking about how um, some of the biggest mistakes agency owners make and they try and go right for marriage um, off the bat and, and pitch this huge proposal. And you talk about getting a foot in the door offer, foot in the door offer, slice off a piece of what you do, add a lot of value to them, charge for it. So we were talking about what would be the, what's some of the best foot in the door offers you've seen either you you personally or some of the agency owners. Yeah. So Ian has a really good one. I'll, I'll talk about that in a second. Um, but one that we, uh, the first one we ever did. So we wanted to sell hundred thousand plus websites. And so we were trying to figure out, well, how do we just cold call these companies? So at the time this was back in maybe 2007, 2008 when the market was going to, crap, right? <laughs> Which yeah. We, we decided not to participate in. And so, amen. right. And so we would call people up that were spending over $10,000 a month in AdWords. So if someone's spending a big amount on pay-per-click, totally. well, they need to have a good website, need, need good conversions. So we would call these brands up and we'd be like, Hey, we notice you're spending over $10,000 a month in AdWords. We, you know, what we see a lot of times is people are overspending. And we offer a service that can actually go through your account and show you a roadmap of what you need to do. Are you interested? And we would charge 2,500 for it. Really almost everybody we would call, we would land because it was targeted, right? We knew something about them. That's the key, right? You just can't butt dial and, and did your research really good results. They were qualified for you. Totally qualified. Like we knew they were spending money on marketing. Like we don't want to work with people that haven't worked in marketing, right? Um, another one, like with, um, Ian, he always does kind of like strategy, right? He'll get on a, he'll, he'll basically kind of set it up. He'll do a, a, a brief call to qualify them and says, Hey, well, I think I can help you out. Here's what we need to do. Let's do a, a, a storyboard session where we map out your avatar. We map out the buying, like their customer journey, their buying process. And he basically maps out all the content that they need to do in video. Right. Yeah. Just, or I've, I've even seen him do it at conferences where he'll sell an about us video. They'll be like, we'll record it. We'll tell you what needs to go in it. And do, people are lining up at the booth. Yeah. And just, you know, it's just easy money for him. So it's a small piece. He's a, he's a really talented at it. And I, I've hired him to do the blueprint session, road mapping session for us. And it's like, this is amazing. So yeah. carving it out. Yeah. And, and the other thing too, I remember uh, Lotus Cars came to us to design a microsite for them. At the time it was that four door Evora core car. They were just like all their and cars. And you're a car before. person too. So is that like a dream for you like to, to get some of these? 
Oh yeah, like when yeah. Lotus came calling, like literally I would have been like, I'll do everything for free. And they just <laughs> offered, they were like, we'll pay you in a Lotus. I'm like, well, I can't pay my people. <laughs> like, like <laughs> where do we have this timeshare of a Lotus? But so all the other agencies, they would develop their pitch, right? And they were like, oh, we'll do this car or, you know, this website, this microsite. And we we're like, well, let's sit, let's step back. Let's do a strategy session. Let us come to your office. Let's go through everything that you need. And we actually charged them for it. And obviously we won that account. We became the agency of record because we did it. Now, if we were competing in some, like everyone else's land, we were a small agency compared to who the other agencies were coming in, like Tribal and DDBO and Gray, like monster agencies. So I didn't want to play on their playing field. I wanted to cheat. <laughs> yeah. It, it builds the relationship in a big way. Oh, of course. And you show them value. Like, because when you come in and pitch marriage, the biggest thing is, is they're constantly trying to figure out, am I going to make the wrong decision? Will this cost me my job? And so how can you make it an easier decision where there's not much risk? Yeah. Yeah. If you pitch marriage first, I mean, I remember when I met my now wife, I knew when I first met her that this is the woman I was going to marry. If I told her that, that would have freaked her out and it would have been really creepy. So that's what people are doing when they are, you know, pitching marriage on the, on the first uh, time with, you know, a company. Oh yeah. You know? And it would be the reverse too. Like if a woman was like, I want to have babies with you, like on the first meeting. <laughs> that, <laughs> that would scare would men like, even more. Oh. That would, yeah, that, that would be even scarier from the, from the male side of things yeah. most of the time. Um, so any, any um, great stories from, cause I know you have uh, an amazing mastermind um, and a group of agency owners, any ones like maybe a before and after that you could think of, of someone who's like, here's what they were doing before they were pitching this, whatever. $20,000 project and here's what their um, foot in the door offer looks like now. Yeah, we, uh, we had a member Jack where he was pitching marriage right off the bat and he had a sales team and his sales team was struggling. He had a long sales cycle and I said, look, let's develop, let's slice off part of your offering and let's have that salesperson and your sales team sell that. When they start doing that, they now have a waiting list and they can pick and choose the perfect client. And it also got rid of like those, those clients that you know you work with. And if you're in a long-term commitment, you're like, oh. Yeah. Crap. Like, it's know, a because, dating phase, right? Oh so. yeah. Because you know, I, I have a motto that there's no such thing as a bad client. There's only a bad process or a bad prospect. And most of the time it's a bad prospect. So if you can kind of use this as a filter and be like, man, this person's a complete nightmare, mm. right? Like, be like, yeah, here's your plan. Can't help you out. Like, <laughs> right. They pay for it. You give them the plan, you hand it off. And the, you know, it's like, you know, it ended after the first or second date type of thing. Yeah. What the result you, was yeah. he grew his revenue by over 400% that next year. Wow. So like in Ian's case, video, like a large video packages and he did the about us because that's the mo you know, people wanted it. What were some of the other specific things you've seen? I don't know, because you, you help a lot of different types of agencies. So if it's like, uh, you know, a website agency, what do you recommend is a good front end? What would be a good like front? Yeah, on a website there? you could do around the pay-per-click audit, right? And, and we outsourced <laughs> the foot in the door to someone else. Now, the, uh, like let's say you're a Facebook agency, right? Amazing foot in the door would be like, hey, would you like me to build you a lead generation system and map it out for you? Like, would you like me to map out a lead generation system? Yeah. And then the best foot in the doors are you doing it with them? Not like you go off into the, your closet and then come back and like present right. it to them because they don't have that much buy-in because you have to, as you're building it with them, you have to map out what they have currently, which is like, let's say that they're just starting Facebook and it goes to a contact us page and you're like, Oh my gosh, like what's going on. <laughs> but if you could be like, Hey, let's take them to an opt in and then let's make sure they engage with they opted in. Right. That's a huge challenge. And if they don't, let's do a contingency and we map it out and we talk about, and before we even start doing that, we help educate them on how much a lead is actually worth and how many leads they're getting and then have them, come up with the impact that you're delivering, not you. Hmm. you. Like if you go, I'll deliver you, I'll make you a million dollars. You're going to be like, yeah, what slime ball? Like I'm not buying your course. I'm not working with you. But if you can get them to be like, oh man, like, so if we do this, like I can make a million dollars extra. And you're like, oh, I gotcha. 
Yes, I love it. Um, this goes into what also, when you listen to your podcast and listen to you talk, you talk a lot about one of the biggest mistakes you talk about that, that agency owners make. I think in general, business, businesses make is they charge too little and it really kind of underlies, it's not just charging too little, it's not showing the value in what they're charging. And so can you talk about a few cases about someone, you know, specifically they're charging X, here's, they weren't showing any value and then they, what value they were showing and then what they ended up charging after. Yeah, we, we, we had a mastermind member that was basically holding on to their clients for maybe six months and they were charging $5,000 a month and it was month to month, right? And they would sell the retainer month to month because it was a lot, big commitment for people, right? And I said, well, let's, let's switch this up. Let's charge a $2,500 foot in the door. And then from that foot in the door, you're gonna position a project. And I asked him, I said, how long is it going to take your clients to see results? And he was like, two months. I'm like, okay, let's do a three-month project and we'll charge 15000 5000 times three. And I said, when they start seeing results, right, we're going to then tell them, hey, I've been thinking about your business and we really want to amplify what you're doing. And then you could start pitching the retainer at 8500 And the retainer is going to be at 12 months. And it's going to auto renew. Right. So rather than being like 30,000 for every client that they got, they at least made over 100K. The other thing that we started doing is they don't know where to price. And like your point, it's like they don't know where to price because they don't know the value. If you don't know the value, your client sure hell doesn't know the value. <laughs> right. Right? Like, yeah. Like, like it's just like, oh my God. And it's amazing how many businesses don't know the value that you, you provide. So that, you know, when I run my mastermind, the first thing I always ask is, hey, what are the successes you guys have? What are the wins, right? I'm doing this so that people can focus on the positive, but I'm also doing it so every six months, I can take the average of the value people are getting and I can divide it by 10, right? And so we're always hopefully raising mm. our prices. <laughs> right. But also people know the value that they're getting as well. And I find you have to constantly, I always talk about benchmarking. So every time you chat with a client, I always tell them, hey, constantly let them know where they were and where they're at now and mm. what you're planning to do. Like mm. the first thing, like come up with the KPIs in the very beginning when you're working with a client and constantly showing them that because they'll always forget. Because we've all had those clients that come to you and be like, hey, I'm leaving. And you're like, my God, we were crushing it for you. Totally. And you did a crappy job at communicating. I heard this from one of my members and I loved it. I'm going to steal it from him. He said, if you don't communicate it, it never happened. Hmm. Think about it. Like yeah. if you're not communicating what you're doing, like when I would teach people how, and it all comes down to the plan. When I would teach people how to race cars and I'd be like, Jeremy, you're going to go through this corner at, which is 90 degrees at a hundred miles per hour. You'd be like, yeah, no, like, no, no, I'm good. I'm good. Right. But if I could explain the plan, I could communicate that to you and show it to you. Then you'd be like, hmm, let me try 60. Let me try 70, 80, 90, 100. And then 110, you beat me. And you're like, yeah, I rule. I'm like, I'm like, oh, I'm a better teacher than a race car driver. You know, benchmarking, I love that. And it, it kind of, as far as, you know, charging too little when you say, oh, it's 5,000 a month. But if you show, I think from a mindset perspective, if you show the client, oh, I'm making you a million dollars and charging 100,000 doesn't seem like that much. So I think from a mindset perspective, from that agency owner, there are people I imagine have mindset issues around raising their prices too. So I'm curious of how you help people kind of shift their own mind. Because, you know, if they're going from 5,000 now, it's like 100,000. Yes, they deserve it and they're adding that value, but are there some mindset shifts that need to take place within the agency owner? Yeah, well, first we kind of nailed it on the head. We have to understand the value we're giving, right? Yeah. So if we're making someone a million dollars and we're charging $1,000 a month, that's really not fair. The other thing you have to shift is price is always irrelevant. You need to figure out urgency, right? So for example, if I'm about to have a heart attack, I'm not going to ask the doctor, how much is it to operate on me? Right. Just do it. I'll figure it out. Right. So that proves the point. Price is irrelevant. So you just have to create enough urgency, trust, and communication where they believe that they can get the result that you're 
that you help them discover. Mm -hmm. The other thing is, is a lot of times we need to get advice from the outside. So um, my family, we, we grew up in Long Island, even though I don't sound like it anymore, right? The rednecks took me over, you know, <laughs> right? Like I it's just, I talk slow. Like when people meet me from the podcast, they're like, are you high? Like, I know you moved to Colorado. <laughs> I was like, no, you just listen to it at two times speed because it talks. A hundred percent. Yes. That's what I do. <laughs> exactly. But my, uh, my uncle worked for a company called Grumman and this company actually made the F-14 Tomcat, you know, the, the fighter jet on top gun. Mm. So one of his jobs in the eighties was testing out canopies for bird strikes. In order to do that, they have this chicken gun. Yes. I was like, where's my guy? I Elon see Musk wants one of those, a flamethrower and a chicken gun. Yeah, yep. exactly. And so this chicken gun puts dead chickens. I'm prefacing dead chickens. Okay. Not live chickens. No one dead has chickens. been injured in this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They're already dead. Right? <laughs> dead chickens and they shoot it at the canopy. Well, they kept breaking the canopy and like, they were like, what the heck is going on? Like it, this canopy is weak as anything. If a chicken keeps breaking it, they reached out to NASA and NASA wrote one line back, unfreeze the chicken like we're standing too close to it so sometimes even me on pricing i have to have people from the outside challenge me and say why are you charging this like every quarter you should be going why am i charging this mm. what's the value people are getting and then come up with the new pricing and be confident with it like don't be like i always my business partner when we do a proposal and we do a pitch he used to come in and be like hundred thousand I'm like is that a freaking question like <laughs> you sound real confident about that yeah I'm like like are you like probing like would you pay a hundred thousand <laughs> like hundred thousand a million you know you do talk about budget and you have some really interesting ways to because that's also another tough, tough question you want to know okay where is this person at not not so that you can charge as much as humanly possible, but so you could deliver as much value as humanly possible for what they're expecting. Um, talk about some of your ways you speak budget with the, the person who is just like, uh, we don't have a budget. Uh, yeah, I love don't that. know what the budget is. Uh, well, it's important to find out the budget because of two things. You can yeah. lose a deal because you're too low. So I met with a company once, you know, I nailed this conversation right over the phone. They invited me in. I walked in their boardroom. It was like this mega boardroom, the biggest boardroom I've ever seen. All these people walk in. I pitch like a $10,000 website. They laugh at me. I come back to the office and people are like, hey, who'd you meet with? I'm like, this company, I don't know, like Brookshire, Brookshire, Brookshire Hathaway. And they were like, <laughs> they were like, they were anticipating a $300,000 pitch, right? So I was selling them a $100 Ferrari. So they were like, what's wrong with you? Is it stolen? Is it a matchbox in the park? <laughs> Excuse me. Right. And so, and then whenever I'm doing like a, a keynote or a speech, I always ask the room, how many people ask for a budget? 50% of the room asks. Out of that 50%, I go, how many people actually get the budget? 25%. <laughs> Excuse me. And then I go, okay, so only 25% of the room is actually getting the budget, meaning people are going in blind. So when people say, I don't have a budget, it's, you got to kind of play with them. It's got to fit your personality too. I'll give you two ways. Yeah. <laughs> I have a your type of sense of humor. So like, I'll, I, I like, like your style. Yeah. So yeah. And so um, I'd say, Oh, I love working with people that don't have a budget. So we don't have to worry about how much money we spend. We can test out all kinds of new innovative ideas. And then you shut up and you can see like their face just kind of like, Oh crap. And they're like, <laughs> Oh, so you do have a budget. <clears throat> and then I would go into what I call a reverse auctioneer where I'll say, all right, I just need to make sure we're the right fit for you, you're the right fit for us. What are you trying to stay around? Wow, I'm choking to death here. And I'll be like, you gotta start high. And so I would say, are you trying to stay around 100,000, 80,000, 60,000 and go down? The reason why I start high is people are programmed to hear the first number mm. and then they're going to forget the rest. Mm. And you'll be able to figure out the budget 99% of the time. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. I'll let you take a couple of drinks. But um, the I want to talk about um, the budget. And as far as if you were going back to Berkshire Hathaway at that point to get that deal. OK, we, we go back in time. What would you have done different um, either on the on the sales call or in the, during the meeting? Well, I would ask the budget. 
and what their expectations are. The pitch I would have kept the same other than add a couple zeros. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I would have won it. They even told me, they go, we loved your presentation. We would have went with you, but you were too cheap. That's we couldn't hilarious. justify that. Yeah. And I'm like, what? Like, what kind of, what, where, like, blew me away. It was the first deal I lost because we were too low. But that happens all the time. Mm -hmm. Right? Wow. So, you know, I just built a house out in Colorado. And um, it's a custom house. And I went to all the builders and I said, hey, here's what I want. All the builders but one came back and was like, you're crazy. You can't build it for that. So I actually went with the most expensive builder, mm. actually raised the budget because they were the most honest. Mm -hmm. People love hearing software stuff. I'm sure you get this question all the time. What software you recommend? What software you use? I know software could be game changing. It could save hours, tens of hours, hundreds of hours. Um, I'm curious of what software you recommend uh, as far as the uh, agencies go. I don't, you know, just, you know, talking to Ian, I know he loves PandaDoc. Um, like, just as a proposal software, what other proposal softwares or any other softwares you recommend to agencies? I love Trello. Trello. Oh my God. I'm such a visual person and for process and, you know, SOPs and just like our content calendar, even our communication portal that we set up with our clients to be like, Hey, here's the strategies we're going over. Here's the meeting notes. Here's what you need to do. You know, like it's just game changing and you can set up a lot of automation. So like when we have a client sign up, you know, it automatically creates the Trello board based off a template that we have. I mean, it's just amazing. Mm -hmm. Any others? PandaDoc, Trello. We, I like us. I don't know how, how did people manage things before like a Trello and Asana? Like, what do you see? Do you see agencies come to you and they don't have any thing set up? Oh, all the time. Uh, so we, um, we developed a lot of our tools back in the day, like through SharePoint. And then um, we got away from SharePoint for our project management time tracking. We used a software called My Intervals. I'm not related to them or anything like that, but mm -hmm. myintervals.com. And that was really kind of one of the first that put everything together in a visualization. And we loved it. Um, but it kept us on track. We'd be like, all right, these projects are on task. We can adjust the milestone. We could create tasks. We knew how much like, Here's the other thing. So many people are not tracking their hours, even if they don't bill on the hour. And if you don't do that, like I realized when we started tracking time, we were losing money on 80% of the deals. Wow. We were really profitable on the other 20. <laughs> it's time. It's time consuming. Um, yeah. So in Trello's free also, I mean, there's probably paid versions, but yeah, you could get it for free. Oh yeah, definitely. Um, any other important software is that you recommend? I mean, any of the marketing automation tools, right, um, are really amazing, but they're just tools, right? Just, you just got to make sure when you automate these things is don't dehumanize everything, right? So like when people jump into my program or jump in the mastermind or whatever, I always create a custom video for them, like a welcome video and let them know, right? Like I want to humanize it. I could just send them a video and automate the crap at every, everything, but where I kind of automate it, I automate reminders for the human element to exist, right? So I'm like, I'll create automation saying, Jason, create Jeremy a task or create me a task to do a welcome video for you. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things that I think you do talk about and that has helped you grow so much is the team and hiring and the culture and you know we talked about a little about the the pipeline thing the initial call then doing the pay you know the, the road mapping and once you start to get traction you really need a higher team and i know you talk about one of the most important hires is a project manager um so i want to talk about the project manager and beyond but what do you look for in a project manager attention to detail and communication mm -hmm. right which i don't have <laughs> <laughs> right. That's why I, for me, that's my first hire, even though I hired a designer and then a project manager, mm -hmm. right. You know, like you got to figure out what is your weakness and then hire for your weakness. Don't work on your weakness. Cause you're already screwed on that. Like just right. <laughs> lost cause. Yeah. It's lost cause. It's kind of like if Walmart worked on their weakness, right. Which is bad customer service and paying their people like crap. 
If they fix that, that means their low pricing, which is their strength, is going to be affected. Right. And now they don't have a competitive competitive advantage anymore. So, you know, figure out what your weakness is and hire for that. Another thing though is you have to have clarity of where you're actually going. So imagine you're on a boat from New York to London, but you don't tell your team you're going to London. You drive the boat for five hours. And after a while, you get tired. You have to go to sleep. But you tell your team, wake me up if the boat changes course. So if you've been on a boat, it changes course every minute. So they literally keep waking you up. You keep having to adjust your heading of where you're going. But if you just told them where you're going, you could sleep like a baby, right? And that's the same thing in the business. We don't have that clarity of where we're going because we're all accidental entrepreneurs. We knew how to do something cool in most cases. And we were like, someone offered us money and we started doing it. So if you take the time to try to figure out why do you exist? Like I love the, the TED talk from Simon Sinek. Why? Right? Because you're not trying to hire your, your identical twin. If I hired my identical twin, it'd be a complete nightmare. I've been fired from every single job <laughs> I've ever held. Like Wendy's for a day. Like I work for like a towel boy. How'd you get driver, fired? Fired, fired? How'd you get fired from Wendy's? I broke everything. Like I, it's a long, it's a whole nother episode. <laughs> I was told I wasn't fast food. And it's <laughs> well, that's probably a good thing. I yeah, guess a very good thing. Um, so is there certain questions in the intake or when you are interviewing them to have them demonstrate the attention to detail and the communication? Oh yeah. So like before we would even chat with them, I, and there's so many, many cool technologies out there. You could put people through a test or you could even test people in the job description, like bury something in the middle being like, yeah. you must respond with pony, pony, pony in the subject line or right. something, right? Right, like, right. Bury totally. that. And if they don't put pony, 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 you never see it. Now, if they put pony, 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 and I'm just making this crap no, up. No, I, like I, pony, pony. Yeah, yeah. And so... If they do that, then you're like, okay, well, let's put them through another test. Maybe we say, I want you to create a video for me on how you would respond to a client about this situation. And you would use like a Trello board for this, right? As the candidates would move through. And then if they, you like that video, then you would go to an interview. Then when you go into the interview, you're now that they've already kind of passed the test of attention to detail and you like how they respond, now it's about a culture fit. Can they fit with the organization? And you got to kind of start with your core values. Like my core values are, you know, um, celebrate wins, share the failures, right? Do more with less, have fun, all right? Um, and, and, you know, be a, a resource, help people, learn something every day. So those are our core values. So I wouldn't just say, hey, check the mark box. Like, do you learn every day? Uh, you should, like, <laughs> that just doesn't work. Like some people would do that. And of course, what are people going to be like? Of course I do. But if you start asking questions around this, be like, well, tell me an instance where you were kind of struggling to find a resource and how'd you go about it? Tell me how, how you went through. You'll find out if they're resourceful because that's a huge thing. And then, then you can make a hire and, and all that. But you have to kind of put them through the paces rather than just one interview. Or, uh, and you, could, you should always be recruiting. Right. So um, that's another important thing. Even if you don't have a job, always be looking for those amazing people. So is the final interview them trying to go around a corner at a hundred miles an hour in a race car? Like, what do you do? Yeah. Well, it's more about, are they going to get along with the team? Yeah. Right. And I'll have the team. They just, you strap them in the, I just picture you strapping them in the back of the race car. <laughs> like, like one of those, I don't know if you've seen those videos where, there's, it's like an Uber driver. The Uber driver is like an actual race car driver and the person yeah, gets Gordon. in. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I see you doing that. Like, just get in. We're going to go for a quick ride to the local restaurant and you just peel, peel away. Oh, yeah. That, one of my favorite things was uh, taking people on joy rides um, on the track. And like literally, I would have people turn green. I've had people throw up. Really? Like, yeah, we were trying for it. We'd be like, because you got to think about like driving a race car – and on the road is totally different. Like most people break going in around the corner while they're in the corner. Well, in a race car, you, you're diving in as deep as you can and breaking in a straight line or you're going to die. <laughs> or we would like slide it out. It was so much fun. Like people would just be freaked out. What's your favorite 
ride you've ever done around a racetrack and what car were you driving? Well, my favorite race car was my 1966 Mustang, right? Like I just love old stuff Mm. and just, you had to drive this sucker with the throttle. There was no ABS, (laughs) right? Like, cause I would, we drive Corvettes or Porsches and that kind of stuff. And I mean, it's hard to, to get the car to spin around because it's just so smart in the technology they have today. But mm. in that car, it's like no power brakes, no power steering. <laughs> like, dude, you sounds can, dangerous. Like gas is leaking into the, you know, the cabin. <laughs> like I was on fire once. So Are I you like, serious? Oh my God. Tom Cruise. <laughs> um, how did you get into race car driving? I went, um, I bought a Mustang, a, a 2002 Mustang. Um, that was my first kind of car I bought. And uh, I started a Mustang club because I was like, I need to meet other co- Mustang people. And so another Mustang club invited us to a track day where you just take your everyday driver on the track. And he took me for a ride to show me. Like, I remember putting on the application because they want, they put you in groups. And I was like, they was like, what's your experience? I'm like, Forza <laughs> on the Xbox. <laughs> and he That's so right. they obviously yeah. put me in the lowest group. <laughs> and he took me around in his 66 Mustang. And I thought it was the coolest mm. thing. Mm. And so that next week, I was like, I got to go buy an old vintage Mustang. And I'm going to turn it into a race car. And just started progressing, you know, through re- regular track days to time trials. And then yeah. obviously to, to wheel to wheel, you know, where um, it's not as, it's not safe. <laughs> That's why I don't race anymore. The dream squasher, uh, wife, two kids, kids and a wife, right? That's yeah. Told me yeah. get out of it. <laughs> um, and it kind of goes to the you have a digital agency experience. I think it's digitalagencyexperience.com, dot com, which it's not just learning in a boardroom or something, but it's experiential. If you want to talk a little bit about that, if anyone's interested, you can go to digitalagencyexperience.com. dot com. But um, you know, talk about, you know, the, there's a core curriculum, like what stuff you go over and then there's an experiential side of it. Yeah. Well, there's no, like what we're doing is we're getting amazing agency owners Mm -hmm. all together to experience something a little bit different. So we're Mm -hmm. talking about what's working, what challenges are you having, but Mm -hmm. throughout the day we're doing things that challenge you both mentally, but also physically. So they, everybody comes out to my house in Durango, Colorado. We own 55 acres on top of this mountain. And so like one of the experiences at the end of the day is hiking up this mountain. Well, it's a pretty steep grade. You've got to avoid bears and mountain lions and stuff like that. You have to sign a big waiver, <laughs> right? But it's like we get up to the top of the mountain and then we can kind of see, we can see New Mexico, right. we can see Colorado, like we can see Utah, all these amazing things. And, right. and and like you're hiking on land from the Pueblo Indians, you know, mm. from thousands of years ago, which is pretty, pretty cool. And then, so we do that for two days. And then the last day is just fun where we take everybody out to um, some old mining towns, old ghost towns that still have structures from 150 years ago that you can walk in. They have jails and all this amazing thing. And we ride ATVs and side-by-sides. And then we rented out a steam engine, the caboose of it, it takes us back through the mountains, back into town. So it's just hmm. a way to experience the amazing Colorado. Like I love being in Colorado and I want everybody to experience the beauty that we have, but I also want you to be able to connect with amazing people, let you know that you're not alone, but also to see what they're currently doing and what's working for them. And how can you use that framework and build on that foundation? hmm yeah, totally. So people could check it out. You're very restrictive. One, they're coming to your house. Two, yes. you know, it's going to be a very small group. So if you're interested, go and there's probably an application there and you have to there talk is. with a team and everything like that. So, but if you are interested, check out, you know, digitalagencyexperience.com. Um, you know, Jason, from the hiring piece, you know, the most important thing, especially when you have a hundred people, you said, you know, you want to communicate the vision, you want to lead the team. What are some things you do to um, keep rock stars to incentivize staff, you know, let them grow, let them feel significant. Um, if you hire the right people, you don't have to worry about motivating them. You just have to worry about demotivating them. Mm. Right. And so, and I experienced it on both ends. So when we were acquired, I was an employee, (laughs) 
And so you seem like a fantastic employee. Um, I'm totally kidding. <laughs> that was the only job I haven't been fired from. Okay, like, that's good. <laughs> but I wasn't that good. <laughs> right? But I would come to them and I'd be like, hey, you know, I think this is a great opportunity that we can leverage. They'd be like, no, no, Jason, we just bought you for revenue and, and the things you're doing. We're just trying to flip, flip the agency. So we sold nine months later, right? They wanted all the revenue that we had. And so I was totally demotivated. I was like, and the reason I was demotivated was you got to think about, I was always able to have significance but because we were contributing to a common goal. We were helping our team grow. We were helping our clients grow. Well, I didn't have that anymore. So I was totally demotivated. Mm. And especially when we sold, I was just like, what's my worth, right? Like, not like my bank account worth, but like, how can I, how can I contribute? How can I grow? How, well, people need, like, do, people don't need me, right? So you want to do that with your employees and your team members and, and be like, and one of the best things I learned was never delegate tasks, hmm. delegate outcomes. So people hmm. can, you know, so give me an example. That, that's, yeah, I like that. So let's say um, we wanted to launch a podcast, right? If I literally, um, or let's say I wanted a better thing, because that's, that's more task oriented. Say, let's say I went to the team, I said, we want to grow our business. And in order to grow our business, I want you to create a podcast. I want you to create a YouTube channel. Like those are all tasks. But if I said, our vision is to be the number one resource in the world for agency owners. We want to create a resource we wish we had, and we want to reach more people. How can we do that? Hmm. That's delegating an outcome. Got it. So then they would come back and go, well, we should probably create a podcast where we interview amazing people. We should probably do it. Blah, blah, blah. It's like they come up with the vision and almost the, the tasks themselves as opposed to you giving it to them. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. What about um, money wise? What are some good structures as far as incentivizing money? So every 90 days, like we would live and breathe by quarters rather than years, right? Mm -hmm. Who cares about the year goal? I mean, obviously it contributes to it, but we would say, all right, here's our company's goal, both in revenue, but here's also our create goal. And then we would communicate that to our team, which would be our leadership team. Mm -hmm. And then our leadership team would come up with their 90 day goals based on that of like, how can we get the company there? What are our personal goals? And then from those goals, we would rank them. And we would put a value on it. So we'd be like, hey, if you're able to hit these goals and the company hits the goals, this is your bonus that you're going to get. So they were incentivized. And then they would do that with their team for the directors. And then directors would do that yeah. for the managers. Managers would do that for the people under. And so it was just really pretty easy to incentivize people. And I like, you know, you do talk about this a lot in the podcast. I can't say enough about that. You know, go to jasonswink.com and check out the podcast he has. But you talk about, you know, people have this, I don't know, uh, they say, well, I'm a $5 million agency or $10 million agency. You really help, you know, harp on, it doesn't matter what your gross revenue is. It matters what you're keeping and, and worrying about your profit margin. And so worrying about the profit margin, how do you decide you want to pay those people, those team members as much as you can bonus wise? How do you structure it so that you're, you know, keep, still keeping a healthy profit so you keep the, the business going? Well, you got to think about your number one asset is your people. Yeah. Right. You're really, if you own an agency with a team, you're really an HR person. Honestly, right. Mm -hmm. You're in the HR business. You're totally. Not in the agency business yeah, totally. You clients and people. And so, yeah, the top line revenue doesn't matter. I always laugh when I, I talk to like, I remember I was talking to one of the big partners for HubSpot, their agency. And you know, they're around 10 million, but their profit margin was like one or 2%. And I'm like, that's not good. Like, I was like, I make more profit in a month. Like that's horrible. Yeah. yeah. And so, but they brag about it or people think success is how many people you have. Right. Success is whatever you make it. Right. I like kind of the significance and in order to be able to do more, you need more profit and you need to focus on EBITDA or net profit not gross profit, right? Like you need to know those numbers as well, but mm -hmm. you know, net profit is everything. Like that's your, that's your blood going through your veins. Like you don't have that. You're screwed. The oxygen. Yeah. 
Um, I talked to a bunch of agency owners in the past two days to see what, what would you ask Jason? Um, some of them had saw, you know, saw your talk that you gave um, in New York. And there were three uh, or four questions people had. Um, one was about onboarding. Um, and, and I guess it's a general question, but they're wondering, like the onboarding process, like once you, you know, you do all this work and get the client and how do you make the smoothest onboard and the onboarding process for an agency could be intense because you're now having to deliver on this whole thing that you mapped out. So I don't know if you have any yeah. general tips on streamlining or, you know, just compressing that onboarding process. Yeah. So, uh, and I go into, if, if you, if there's more detail that you guys want, make sure you go check out the agency playbook. Cause we have a whole system for that, yeah. but where can they find it, that? Yeah. Just go to jasonswank.com and just click on playbook. Playbook. Gotcha. Okay. You guys will see that. So, yeah. but the biggest thing is, is think about when you're onboarding, what is your client that you just sold? What are they thinking right off the bat? They're thinking, did I make the right decision? <laughs> They're literally going to the negative part. So you have to over communicate to them. That's why I always create a custom video. But on the onboarding process, you should automate a lot of this, mm -hmm. right? You should look at going, what could we use technology for in order to make sure we don't miss out on anything? So we used to have a document and, 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 and hence now like in the playbook, we, go, we give people a Trello board that goes through everything. And it's like, all right, Mr. Client, here's where we need to start. It literally goes through the whole plan and it creates a check mark of everything that they need to do Mm -hmm. for you in order to be successful. It also goes over what are the KPIs that they're looking at? What's their expectations? Who mm -hmm. are the contact people that are going to be involved in this project? If it's a committee, God bless you. <laughs> like, good luck with that one. Yeah. But like, here's all the things. It lays out everything. So you got to over communicate. Remember, like my mastermind member said, if you don't communicate it, it's not done. Yep. And so have... You just have to document the process and you have to build it over time. So when you go through and you make a mistake, which you guys are always going to make mistakes, be like, how can I adjust our process to avoid that? And let's put that in and always be adapting and changing. It's not like I paid a consultant to do this. I'm good. Like, no, no, it's like, it's a constant moving target of making it better and better. Like I'm always changing my stuff. Always. You don't adapt, you die. The other one someone asked is you talked about in your talk about the personal brand being so important in building an agency. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, they, they said, I remember that being my favorite part of the talk and my fit. They, yours was there. They, they resonated with whatever you talked about the most out of that whole conference. Mm -hmm. Um, not to make your head too big, but, um, the they couldn't remember exactly what you said about the personal branding side yeah so you got to position yourself as the person of authority but you got to be kind of careful on that right it's kind of like i use the example in there i was like imagine if i came up to you in the conference jeremy and i said hey uh hey i'm jason and then you are jeremy. it doesn't matter who you are let me tell you how perfect <laughs> i am right like yeah. i'm doing the rock right and like all i do is talk about myself i'm positioning myself as the you know, the star in, in their story. And that's, you know, it's kind of the framework that Donald Miller talks about at the story brand, which I like. We've been doing that for years. Mm -hmm. And so everybody's positioning themselves as the hero. And so you're positioning yourself as Batman. If you position yourself as Batman, you're making them Robin. And literally I asked in the audience, I said, who dressed up as Robin for Halloween? And there was one person. I was like, oh, yeah. I was like, I'm sorry. Like, did your mom dress you? Like, like no one dresses as Robin, right? But you have to position yourself as Alfred. And in order to do that, like you have to pick a niche. Yeah. You have to know that niche. You have to have passion. Like I live and breathe about agency life. Like yeah. I love it. Yeah. Like I'm thinking about it all the time. If I go for a hike or a mountain bike, I'll be like, oh, I need to, I need to write this down and create this content to help people because I thought of this idea. Like you have to get into that point. It's the same thing like with Gary Vaynerchuk. Now, people struggle with this because they don't know what to create, right, for content. But they don't know what to create because they probably haven't narrowed down into a niche that they really have passion or knowledge in. They, they may have taken someone's BS course 
and they'd be like, here's the most profitable niches for agencies. No one can tell you a niche. You have to figure that out. It takes mm -hmm. a while. Like yep. it's not overnight. The next thing you really need to do is figure out what, you know, that people that kind of really struggle with is, well, if I'm the face of the organization, people are always going to want to work with me, right? They're always going to want to work with me personally, and they're never going to work with my project managers. The perfect example is Gary Vaynerchuk. He doesn't work with his clients. Most clients don't even see him, and he's upfront with that. He just, look, I'm ADD like everybody else. You don't want me managing your project. <laughs> you want my team to do it. They're the rock right. stars. Right. And you just need to involve, like in the sales process, you need to involve your team when you qualify them so they get to meet your team and yeah. understand how amazing your team is. Yeah. Because now you can create something that people get really excited about. So like I have, um, I have a lot of clients creating podcasts. You know, I have one client, Zach, he created this building manufacturing podcast dominates. Now he gets paid, you know, you know, in order to, you know, people are like, they chat with him. They're like, Oh my God, is it really you? You're going to show He's up. He's the authority. He's the authority. Yeah. Right. So obviously they want to work with the agency that puts out the information, not just because of, you know, they know how to do the information that, but now they trust you. They understand the plan. Totally. Um, I have one last question, but I know you have to run. So I want to point people towards jasonswank.com or swank.it if you want the podcast. Um, Jason, thank you so much. I want to be the first one to thank you. Uh, fantastic. And, you know, I really encourage everyone to check out what you have going on at jasonswank.com. Oh, thanks so much, man. Great, great questions. You, you did your research. 375 episodes later, you know, that's, that's what it is. So people will that's intense. And, should, <laughs> and should listen to it. So I appreciate it. And, um, you know, check it out and the digital agency experience.com. Jason, anyone should check out jasonswank.com. But um, I want to talk about some horror stories um, and some tough times because this is really what, you know, makes us flex our muscles as an entrepreneur and leader. So what were some of the horror stories, tough times in the in agency? Well, I remember one, this is actually kind of a funny story. So we actually changed our billing terms uh, to really kind of get more paid faster from our clients. And we would never do any creative until we got everything from our clients. And so this one company, I think this was back in 2006, um, we pretty much got paid for everything, like maybe $80,000 or whatever, but they never got us the information what we needed. So we were just on hold. Well, they, we sold the agency in 2012. They actually contacted us in 2014 saying, I finally have everything. <laughs> and I'm like, how many years uh, later? Is I think it's a little late. Like wow. we've been sold a couple times. And uh, so that was just a, a funny story. Um, but, you know, a horror story was, you know, when, and this happens to everybody, right? Like we get a big deal. And we get real excited and the client says, what? Checks in the mail. So we go ahead and do work. We trust them. We will leave the checks in the mail. We spend like a hundred K on building this application and we keep getting excuses, checks in the mail, checks in the mail. And then finally we turn over the work and then they get crickets. We can't reach them. Wow. Right. We put all those resources on it. We actually went over scope. And literally it almost killed us at the time. So, you, just, you know, those are a million other stories. About so make that. sure to get paid up front or make, get paid a portion. Always get paid in advance at certain milestones. And when people say the check's in the mail, hold up and be like, hey, you know, we'll, we'll wait for the check. <laughs> yeah. And then exiting wise. Alternative methods. <laughs> yeah. Exiting wise. I know you had a few tips um, exiting no wise. Not. No or no. <laughs> you have that written like, on your wall. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. So, but hey, it, it was a lesson learned where I can keep other people from being burned. Like it cost me millions. I still did well. Right. So don't, don't feel bad for me. I'm not crying for you. Don't uh, no. no. So, but literally I've been able, able to, in my life to hit pretty much every goal I've ever wanted to go after. But when you're bought and they put a certain thing based on performance and they're going to pay you over time, in order to hit the valuation that you want, like you, you're out of control. Like they totally dictate what goes on. And that was the case where 
I, I didn't have any control, so we didn't hit our numbers. And literally, they sold the second time, which, the, and like to the day, they, like it had it work is like, if we dip below this, we wouldn't get, right? And we literally dipped below for like a day, and that was the day that they sold. Um, so then it cost wow. us a lot of money. So don't be happy with the cash up front and the guarantees, um, and just assume you're not going to get the earnouts because it will cost you millions. Cool. Everyone check out jasonswank.com, all the podcasts. You should listen to every single episode. If you don't, you should be, you should feel bad about yourself. So Jason, thank you. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See lights like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.